science is an art backed by science. So every mortician you meet, every film director you meet, <clears throat> is an artist backed by science. Science because it uses numbers. Numbers to calibrate how much fluid I put into a body to embalm it. Uh, the numbers that I need for what my specialty is, is cremation. I do cremations. I cremate people. That's my Back when I used to work for Haran and McConaughey, and the family wanted to do a cremation witness, which is like a cremation with the family watching, I would tell them, my name is Curry. I am a cremationist. This is a crematorium. My name is Kareem. So it seems blatant that I was meant to be a cremationist. Right? <clears throat> so what I told the last class, and kind of give it the watered down version of what a mortician is. A mortician is a human garbage man. You dispose of bodies properly, efficiently, professionally, with sanitation and, uh, what do you call it? Sanitation and just great. <laughs> um, but my claim to fame is got a reputation in Colorado, good reputation, unlike what's been going on in the news lately. Has anyone been seeing what's going on in the news lately from funeral homes and their crap? Yeah. If you get a hold of that, that's what you should not do to the people there. And the main thing, what you do as a mortician, um, you're a, like I said, custodian. You're also a counselor. You're a salesman. You're a director, and you're just the main steward of the people. You serve the people. Um, my thing is with cremation is I do that shit. I do it all week long, six, seven days a week. I've been doing it for over 17, 18 years. So my goal when I first started off was to cremate at least a whole state. <clears throat> I had big goals. So right now, I think my numbers are out at 30,000. That's how many people I have done. Uh, embalmings, I embalm rarely. Not a lot, but when I do it, I enjoy it. I love it. It's fun. I have people. Um, I do much of the lottery thing. But before I proceed, anybody has any questions? I say nits because uh, here in North America we're a potpourri of culture, and we don't ever we don't all share the same culture. I mean, we don't share the same view, views, beliefs, perceptions. But the one thing we do hold in common is that we're American. Okay, so that gives us the cherry on top. We can experience many cultures in one as long as you're open up to it. <clears throat> and as a mortician. If I am to be a funeral director, which you see when you go to funerals, the guys standing in suits, being all nude, and that's the funeral director side of it. There's trades within this situation with the mortuary science. You've got embalmers, you've got cremationists, you've got transporters, you've got uh, reconstruction, people who reconstruct bodies, which will lead into another thing. And mortuary science, like all the other health professionals, you can start one thing and stop. You only have a start and stop. Like with a cardiologist, the cardiologist can only go so far to help save that patient. It's why it's out of his scope, it's out of his spectrum. But as a mortician, there is no stop. We have to deal with what death does. Death doesn't announce to you when it's coming. Death happens. We have to act to it. We're unlike. First responders were the last responder. Okay, so with death care, there is no end. And I can share a story with you as, as an example. 
during my internship with the Newcomer Funeral Home, uh, we had a case come in, a situation. When I say case, I mean people. So I'm not trying to be insensitive. I'm just trying to be PG about it, okay? We had a case come in, and it was a grandmother. <clears throat> grandmother was in the passenger seat with her granddaughter. Grand, your granddaughter, grand, you know, managed the driver and whatnot. And uh, the granddaughter lost control of the car. Car rolled. And grandma got the shit in the stick, in my opinion. She got the shit in the stick. So grandma ended up having to have her skull dragged for hundreds of feet. It was a nice little saw job. All of this right here, just gone, just sawed off. Granddaughter felt bad about it. Family wanted to do a traditional burial, and the embalmer that I got a chance to shadow, it was great, it was awesome. Uh, he did what a mortician should do. Even though he was the embalmer, he made sure he found out the likes and dislikes of what grandma was going through. Come to find out, grandma loved hats. What a beautiful find. As an artist, you can interpret this, right? So what this mortician did is that he had the granddaughter pick out grandma's favorite hats, okay? And he would pick out grandma's hat. And what he did is he coordinated the hats with the color of the casket. He did the reconstruction he could do to grandma's face, take down the bruising, whatnot. Because like I told you, there's no stopping. There is no, no, you can't. You make miracles happen as a mortician. You make miracles happen. It's crazy what we pull off. We make miracles happen. So this mortician has the embalmer. He went through all the bruising that he's done with grandma's face. He was able to actually place her in the casket strategically to where the hat is concealing all this gone. Had the hats placed around the head of the casket, grandma's favorite hat that the granddaughter picked out. And the granddaughter, at the end of it all, before they were actually going to show grandma to the family, the granddaughter got a chance to sit there with her grandmother for 15, 20 minutes and look at this woman and remember her the way she saw her last. And that meant the world to her because her granddaughter felt guilty. Just by doing that small little thing, being humane, being the counselor instead of just the embalmer, he was able to help heal a family and to give a funeral that they weren't expecting at all. That's what we do as morticians. We make shit happen. What do we call? We're called the miracle workers. So when we're about to lay down on our beds at 10 30 at night when everyone else is asleep, the calls, two o'clock in the morning, gotta get up. I'll be there in less than an hour. Show up, and lo and behold, you'll see someone who's 550 pounds downstairs <laughs> in the corner, slumped over, and you've got to figure out how to get this body from downstairs, upstairs, back into the morgue, right? The grace of professional. So I'm doing it with shoes, suit, and tie. Because I'm that first impression with the family. Would you rather they come to your house pick up your loved one with dirty sweat, smell like boo boo weed, coffee stained in my shirt? How would you feel? How would you feel if I did that? Be professional. You would be like, yeah. Mom, are you sure this is cool? Do you actually you like cool to put this thing? Yeah. Versus showing up clean, shoe clean, slack. Hi, shirt. How do you feel then? More respect, yeah. But I wouldn't want to come into your house and be like, "Yo, where's where's the dad at?" No, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. But I would come in with some levity and be able to come in as the person who is going to remove the loved one with respect, but be as efficient as I can be with that 550 pounds of cream slumped over in the corner of the room. That's what we do. <clears throat> we perform miracles. I've been doing this for over 18 years. But like I said, I, uh, I've been in healthcare since I was 14. 
So I've done things in healthcare from geriatric psych units, Alzheimer's, um, Deborah Cleo Wallace. I worked there. If y'all know about that place, does anyone know about Deborah Cleo Wallace? Oppositional conduct disorder kids out in Westminster, the kids who fight and either have a, the only option in life is either you're going to the psych ward or you're going to go to jail for the rest of your life. Or kids who are violent, or kids who've been beat up, or kids who've been sexually perped on, or kids who are sexual perps. I worked with those populations because my main thing was to be a clinical psychologist. That went from that to working in the hospital for us, doing wound care, doing telemetry tests, taking up 12, six, 12 leads on the people's chest, monitoring their hearts. Um, so I've done a lot of healthcare. So I've ended up on this spectrum of healthcare being a mortician because I like to serve families. I like to work with my hands. I learn better with my hands and do better with my mind, my hands. And I like doing artistic stuff. I like turning something that looks horrible to somebody into something that's memorable. Because when it comes to death, uh, our main objective with embalming and being morticians is to. Uh, Um, do you have Ian on last right now? No, Ian's not here, sorry. Thank you, sorry to interrupt. The main objective to uh, with mortuary science is to leave a lasting impression with the family. So this is the last time you're going to see me, Mom, before she's buried or before she's cremated. And so we're going to leave that image with y'all instead of having you remember me, Ma, with bile down her mouth, running face all crooked, all rigor mortis or green. We're not going to leave that with you. Because as I said, as a mortician, I'm part counselor. Counselor, salesman, embalmer, cremationist removal. I'm jack of all trades, but this is what I do. So I get a chance to work with forensic psychologists or coroners, a lot of us hang out together because we have that same mentality, but we also help each other out. Like what you learn here with forensics, you learn about markings and identifying things. Well, as a mortician, we do the same thing. It helps gives us a, a roadmap as to what we can and cannot do with the body. Case in point, decompose bodies. It's best to embalm a body a good 24 to 36 hours of death. After that, even though you think that you're dead, you're not. You're now the host to everything that's inside you. That bacteria, those viruses are trying to live. They give two craps about whether or not you're alive. Because while you're alive now, you're dying. You're dying. It's, death is not an option. It's going to happen. When? I don't know. Hopefully not. Today, as long as you got today, live like it is tomorrow. But take care of yourself. Because what you do today, what you keep doing on today, will carry on into the future. So when you do catch your last breath, all that funkiness inside of you is going to eat you up because it wants to live. So you're a living host. So like, that's what you see when you see these cops. You see whatever's going on inside of them overtaking their body and it's driving to live. And that's one of the things where I come in. I want to make sure the body is disinfected and sanitized so when you go up to have your kiss of death, it's an actual thing that lasts. So you're not kissing a Mima on sperm from 1965 that no one knew she had. Maybe a lot of people don't know. That. But that's the one thing that I'm here, I'm like that mediary because of what we don't have here in this country. And how mortuary science showed up here, one of the longest professions in the world. So while the rest of the world was hiding during COVID, me and my team were out there picking up bodies, creating bodies, embalming. We didn't stop. The rest of the world stopped and hid from viruses. We were at the forefront dealing with these things, seeing these things. I'm 
protect my king. So that way they can have longevity. Even during the Black Plague, there was these people who were out there picking up bodies, carcasses off the streets of Europe, tossing them into the Thames River in England, or in the, the Rhone, across from Germany and up into France. Um, but here in the States, the act of embalming, you know, of practicing mortuary science, became really big during the Civil War. What we had going on were body parts and bodies, bodies out in the field rotting, doing Lord knows what. No one knew what to do with it. So they instituted some old science on how to preserve and keep the bodies within the various plants. So that way they can take the soldiers back to the home, get them off the field, disinfect, which also relates to why we have Memorial Day. In honor of the, the veterans, the troops. Memorial Day, started by African chattel slaves who kept to their culture about honoring the dead. Finding these people who had been oppressing them for years and still respecting the fact that they were dead and, and, and giving them a place of burial. Unheard of in America. We weren't doing that there. Just, oh yeah, Korean is dead? That's how they treated the body. But now it's different. Like I said, we don't have a shared culture, but we have shared land. And right now we get a chance to exchange ideals and learn from each other. And that's one of the things that another part of the thing of being a mortician is I have to understand people's culture. That way I can help them honor the dead and keep and be close to their culture. So just even in death, culture and rights goes with you. If you don't know your culture, you won't know either tomorrow or you won't. You just won't. So in the meantime, honor your dead, honor your family, honor your culture. That's all you really got. If you don't have it, what are you? Any questions, comments, concerns so far? How many of you have been to a funeral? Oh, my condolences to you. So were you chance were your chances good to help out the family? Do you feel like there was something that you experienced that was a good experience or a bad experience? Yeah, we were really we were pretty close to his family and my family, so Mm, wow. My condolences to them. But you too are kind of a family. disassociated myself just because you know I didn't really want to feel so overwhelming. Um, I didn't really want to see one of my aunties. So like I said, I was really just trying to disassociate um, and kind of be there for the rest of my family so that I'm not really like trying to present my emotions. close to him, but since I was young, I didn't really understand, and like, I know my parents like told me like, you know, if he's not gonna come back, then just like, okay, let's see what he got. Yeah, I've seen that happen. Yeah, for me, it felt really cool to have him for him since there was a baby, and so it was kind of sweet.
Ups, they've seen them in the downs, they've seen them in the midways, they've seen people looked out of their minds. So this is where I am at right now, where it's the end of life. That this is where people will actually just kind of come together and be there for each other and celebrate, right? Um, I, myself, I enjoy funerals because it's just a big potpourri of feeling. And it's one place where I can just be, I can, it's okay to be a human being. I don't have to worry about um, nationality. I don't have to worry about nationality. I don't have to worry about gender. It's just that we're there to celebrate someone's life and to console with each other and be human. A little bit of humanity. And like I said at the last class, and I'll tell you, something that I learned in my walk and just being a mortician is that you can judge how society is based on how they treat their dead. And the end would be all over it all. Um, because it's something to behold. But I'm here for more, some more input from y'all, whatnot, any curiosities, anything like that, we really won't embellish you all with what I just sit with so much curiosity. If y'all have any need or want to do things like forensic psychology or uh, being a pathologist or even a technician or even a mortician of some sort, I advise you go and check out your local funeral home. Say, hey, I'm interested. What can I do here? Can I take out the trash for y'all? Help out with memorial folders. Yeah, you'll be open to it about it. You know, from there, the door will open up. Like I said, forensic psychologists, coroners, pathologists, come hang out with each other. Because you'll see things that it's not normal to see on a day to day basis. We're telling you that. It's not normal at all. And we're kind of a different kind of. But it's not doom and gloom. It's not. It, it's it's a part of life. Death is not an option. It's something we all must go through and deal with. But how you approach it, that's on you. But that's where people like me step in and help to encourage people to move forward and to not look back. Live your life. Live your life. Um, outside of that, any questions, concerns? No? Yeah. Some of you guys do the class forensic psychology. It's a very cool class. I wish I had the staff. Uh, it's a really just good one. <laughs> what brings y'all get into it? this curiosity that people have and you wonder why people have on like what kind of like you're curious about them and I feel like that's what brought me to this class was because I wanted to learn more not only about that but um, just how forensics works in general and how it 
or you need to see many different aspects of life. That's what you'll get to see in the next chapter. Pretty cool. And then I was pretty confident once I came to the class that this, this book was ever offered to me. And this is something that when I was doing my mortuary course, Y'all up here at the pinnacle have this class because God, that that's a giant. I'm not kidding, <laughs> y'all. This might be just a handful of y'all, but it's me. So it's a great, great class because they get to learn about biology. They get to learn about like technology. They get to learn about how like the court systems work. It's it's like government plus science plus biology rolled into one. It's a great class. COVID was happening, I was laughing. I was not laughing at the death of it all, but laughing at the media and the propaganda because as a mortician and working in healthcare, I'm looking at it like, okay, the government's freaking out about a virus, but there's germs, and there's other viruses that are 10 times more, more effective than what COVID's doing. Kind of virus that if I got it today, I'd be done tomorrow. That type of virus. But how the society dealt with a virus and how they him and hawed off of just being preventive. Washing your hands. It's that simple. Washing your hands. That's all you got to do. And then how people treated that. Or wearing masks. Like, I was right to wear a mask. Well, if you stop spitting and spitting. Maybe you can stop wearing masks. Simple stuff and how society was turned upside down. But at the same time, having to run a removal team, being the person over a removal team and cremating these people with, with the virus and embalming them without catching it from these people and without spreading it. Not one of my team got it. Walk the clock. Team of, team of 10 plus me. I didn't get it. It was my team. How I got it, how I finally got COVID, was someone that I was uh, involved with who was working at the ER and Parker Adventures. Constantly COVID, COVID, COVID. On my day off, she came back to the apartment. She had it. I got it that night just by mere contact alone. And poor Autumn. Saw her father sweating out the sweats within 24 hours and, oh, daddy, wiping the sweat off my forehead. Then she caught it. Three people were infected in less than, what, two days. Man, I never want to go through that again. It's those horrible COVID things. But, but yeah, as a mortician looking at it, people freaking out over a virus. And if they do something preventive by just simple hygiene. As a mortician, like I said, my thing is to disinfect and sanitize bodies when it comes to embalming or covering up the body deceased. Or if it's like a cremation witness, I advise you not touch the body, but you know, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it, but you're running the chances of touching any of the other living organisms we're talking about. And spreading that.
last thing. Open it all and spray it. It's dry on it. Oh, you want to spot you used spoke about how the embalming process works for a minute. Would you be willing to explain that again for this class? Yeah. Um, with embalming, you're taught the basic foundation of embalming, right? But let's go back to the original point I said, and let's just remember our art is backed by science. You teach from the basics of the colors, right, in art. You get pastels, you get the blues, how you approach the final product is off of you, right? So as far as me when I embalm, okay, I will take out some of the seasoning and I will wash them off, giving it a last bath, not only just out of respect, but also for hygienical purposes too. So in the midst of embalming, I don't want whatever bacteria or whatever is on the body get involved into the, the whole embalming process and yuck everything up. I don't want that to happen. So what I end up doing is I'll wash the body, and as I'm washing the body, I will break rigor mortis. You all have learned about rigor mortis, right? And I don't know but in your book, but rigor mortis starts within two to three hours after death. And what rigor mortis is, make sure you guys remember this, and we'll leave you with it's that last bit of ATP in the muscle that gets act up and they stay that way, right? And as you know, the last thing to go in the body is the brain. After the brain is gone, you're essentially dead. You could be breathing, but your brain is gone, you're dead. So as I'm washing the body, I start to break the rigor. And then as I start to move the wrists, the hands, the arms, I try to get the body flaccid all over again. So that way I can reconstruct body for the position and pose. Um, I try not to break the bones, but sometimes when they're old and frail, it happens. And I feel bad. So <clears throat> it's a disaster. But in the midst of breaking rigor, I'm also saying I had yes. Uh, has there ever been a, a time where you just like literally 